Hello, my friends. Welcome to Minute to Win It, where we are talking all about the power and the importance of a first impression. Now, everyone tells you that you never have a second chance to make a first impression. You've heard them talk about how important it is to really connect with people and to have people understand who you are so quickly. Now, in real life, first impressions are based on a number of things, a wide range of characteristics. You have everything from age, race, culture, gender, physical appearance, um, the way that you speak, your accent, your voice. And so when you are meeting somebody for the first time and they're seeing you for the first time, everything from how you carry yourself to how you're dressed, your accessories, what you drive, all of these things are going to impact a client's impression of you. But you're not going to get a seat at the table. You're not going to have the opportunity to speak to someone for the first time and to even get to that place unless you can pass the blank test. Now, what's the blank test? This is where online impressions happen. Online impressions take place in one tenth of a second. It's so fast. It's like that. The minute someone becomes aware of you, online, suddenly they're starting to form an opinion. And so today we're going to do two different things. First, we're going to talk about cultivating a first impression and a presence online. We're going to do that with things like working with a client avatar, studying related brands, con you know, working towards brand consistency. And we're going to use everything we do digitally to get us in the room in real life. And that's where the fun stuff happens. So let's jump in. The first thing that we want to do when we are creating an online presence is to really decide who are we speaking to? Who's our ideal client? Because when you're trying to talk to everyone, you're really speaking to no one. And so we start with a client avatar. This is where you design who your ideal client is. Who are you for? And we'll start with very broad range brush strokes, things like age education. Where does your ideal client live and what do they do for a living? What are their core beliefs? What do they read and watch on TV? How do they entertain themselves? Do they take vacations? What brands do they love? What aspirations do they have? And you'll start kind of beginning to envision who the perfect person is for you to work with. Now, once you've done that, we're going to dig even deeper. How do your clients imagine themselves in the world? What is it that your client wishes were true about themselves or about others? What do they fear and why are they hosting this wedding or event? What memory is it that they truly value? In order to develop your online presence, in order to know what you're going to say and how you're going to say it, you really need to focus first on your client. Who are you talking to and what do they care about? Once you have an idea, of who these people are. Now I want you to go out and do a complimentary brand association review. This is where you try to figure out who are my clients already comfortable with? Are they people who buy one brand over another? And so we want to look and feel like we make sense in their digital universe. So look at fashion every different type of brand. So are your clients wearing Banana Republic or are they wearing BCBG? Do they shop at John Bravados or are they YSL people? Take a look at the trusted brands in fashion that they already know and love and then see what you can pull out from that. What can you borrow and how can you be influenced for your own online digital branding? Look at cars. Are they Tesla people or are they Toyotas? Look at hotels. Are they staying at Montage, Waldorf Astoria, do they like Curio Collection, or are they Marriott Hilton people? Take a look at art and music. What are they listening to? How are the artists that they're comfortable with branding themselves? And always take a look at real estate. Everything from new home sales and interior design to older sales, because you want to see how do your clients live? What do they surround themselves with? And start pulling out little pieces. For example, what fonts do the brands that your clients love use? If they're using strong, clean lines, that conveys one very specific type of message. Whereas a bouncier script is going to convey something else. A strong line 
is modern. It's timeless. It has a sense of consistency to it and it's very trusted. Whereas a bouncier script can show something that's a little bit more artistic, a little bit more free flowing, not as rigid. You want to look at color theory. Are your clients surrounded by brands that really kind of deep dive into neutrals and metallics, things that are enduring and very rich looking? Or are they drawn to pastels and lighter tones that are maybe more romantic and sentimental? Are they using hero images and what are they of? Are they very wide kind of landscape items where you see a lot of detail and you can be inspired by a lot of things? Or are the brands that your clients drawn to focused on a very tight, very, very detailed photo where there's one thing for them to focus on and they're not worried about everything else that's off to the side. These are the things that you are going to use so that you can create social proof and you can start storytelling in your own brand. Now, social proof is about highlighting features and testimonials, third-party endorsements that you have already received so that a client finds you online and they see you. Maybe they see you in a magazine. Maybe they see you on The Knot. Maybe they see you featured on somebody else's Instagram. This is a third-party endorsement that builds trust. And you use this along with everything else that you've pulled from what you know about your clients to create a story. This is really where you start setting yourself apart because nobody else has had your experience. Nobody else has lived your life. Nobody else has studied the way that you have. Nobody else shares your why, even if it sounds similar. It's not an exact match. And so this is your opportunity to go out and start setting yourself apart by saying, this is who I am. This is what I believe. This is why I'm doing the things that I do. And this is why I'm not just the right choice for you, but the only choice for you. Because ultimately, a first impression is about making a connection. How is it that you are connecting with people online? So when you're starting to think about connection and you've done all of your research, the first thing we wanna do is you wanna make sure that you have not just one, but a series of professional headshots. We all have iPhones. We all have things like that, that we can take a kind of, you know, quick image of ourselves, but there's nothing that is ever going to serve you as well as a professional headshot. And this can be something just as basic as a shoulder and above. It could also be a lifestyle shot where you're out walking around town. It can be you working at your computer. It can be you on site doing what you love to do and showing people the behind the scenes. You need a collection of images where people can not only identify very, very quickly who you are visually, but that it tells something about yourself. So make sure that your images are very, very well styled, that they're well lit, that if you wear hair and makeup, you have hair and makeup done, that you've put thought behind your jewelry, the aesthetic, and the environment that you're going to be shot in. And then you want to use these to showcase yourself all across social media. Now, obviously, social media is very personal. I know people who really don't engage in it, which I find a little bit crazy because social media is the greatest gatekeeper. It allows you to own your narrative. It allows you to talk to people directly. So you want to have things like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, a podcast, and a TikTok. When you have these, you want to make sure that you're using the professional photos that are most appropriate for that platform. So Instagram head and shoulders picture is fantastic because you want people in that tiny circle to be able to see you. On Facebook, maybe the top banner, you want a photo of you working. Twitter, YouTube, again, we have really tiny kind of icons for our face, but podcasts and TikToks, things like that, this is where you can use a photo that shows you doing what you do and people will start to recognize you. So all of a sudden they bounce from your Facebook page to your Twitter and they go, okay, that's the same person. This is where I can continue my conversation. They go from your Twitter to your YouTube and they see a very similar picture and maybe a slightly different header, but all of the photos need to reinforce who you are, what you do, why you do it. And then once you've caught them visually, now you can hook them in with messaging. Now you can start really going live. So whether it's on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, 
you have to let people see you. You have to let them hear you. It isn't enough to hide behind the static images on your profile. You really need a way to start connecting in real time. And then you want to give them a call to action. It sounds silly, but you need to tell people that you want to work with them. You need to encourage them to reach out. You need to ask them to comment. It's too easy to just kind of double tack and like something. What you want to do is you want to say to people, I'm here for you. I'm not lecturing from my profile. I'm here because I want to talk. I'm here because I want to get to know you. So ask them to engage. And above all else, make it easy for people to get in touch with you. Make it easy in that your website is responsive, that it works beautifully, not just on a laptop, but on an iPhone and on a tablet. Make sure that when you're getting messages and you're getting DMs, that you're actually answering them in a timely manner, that if you have a submission form, that it's working and it goes to you. Because as a client, if somebody is trying to reach you and they can't, they very simply and quickly move on to the next. So being responsive, being present, and being active on social media is going to be tremendous. And once you are very comfortable going live and you're comfortable in front of the camera, I cannot stress to you enough the importance of really developing a video series. Now, you can't sell what you can't show. And so many people are moving away from traditional cable, traditional television, traditional mediums. They want YouTube. They want IGTV and a branding video, something that allows you to talk about who you are, to talk to your clients, to share the behind the scenes about what it is you do, why you do it, and how you do it is going to go a very long way. Now at the very end of this presentation, I've got some bonus content where I'm gonna tack on two or three different branding videos and you're gonna be able to watch and see. One of them is just a global branding video. One of them is very specific about how I work with vendors. This is to encourage other professionals and creatives to try to work with me and to want to work with me. And another one takes you behind the scenes and talks specifically about what we did for one wedding and why. So make sure you stay to the end and you can check those out. The last thing that we're going to talk about here is published content. Now there are a couple of different ways to create published content. You can do posts on your Instagram and on your Facebook. You can write blogs. You can share on LinkedIn. You can submit original works as a thought leader to places like Inside Wedding, The Knot, and other blogs that you work with. And you can also be published, whether you do that self-publishing or whether you work with an actual publisher. I can tell you I've written two books. I have a magazine company, The Wedding Editorialist, where we do cover to cover the entire magazine is dedicated to one couple or one wedding professional. Now, why is this important? It's important because in a lot of ways, people feel like print is dead, but it's not dead. Print is reserved for luxury. Print is reserved for importance. It's reserved for those who care. And so whether or not you decide to publish something on your own so that you have a thing that you can hand someone, or if you decide to go and get published on another site, the act of writing establishes you as a thought leader. And when a client sees that you've been published or that your input has been included by other magazines and by other blogs, you will immediately set yourself apart as an expert. Now, the entire point of all of this is to get you in the room. The entire point of doing all these things digitally is so that somebody will reach out and say to you, hey, I really like this and I want to get to know you better. I want to work with you. I want to figure out if we're a good fit. So when that happens, now's the fun stuff. Now is where you have to go in and you have to deep dive again into your clients. So we already did the client avatar. Now we have a real live person in front of us. So I'm going to take you through a little research and development case study that I recently did because back to back, I got, um, I had two different couples reach out to me, totally different couples, totally different clients, totally different events. The first reached out to me because they are having a baby and they wanted to design a really incredible baby shower. The second reached out because they are newly engaged and they're planning a wedding. So what's the first thing I do? I follow them both back on Instagram. I find them on Facebook and I start 
to research who they are. And while I'm doing this, I'm pulling pictures, the things that jump out at me, the things that I see over and over again. I'm looking for anything that connects me directly to my client. So just like we did in the avatar, where are they going? Where are they vacationing? Where are they eating? What brands are they carrying? How are they dressed? How are they looking? What are the things in their lives that seem the most important to them? And I always screen grab those and I pull them out. Then I go back to my own profile, but my personal profile. I go back to my life. This isn't about work. This is about being a person. And I say, okay, where do I connect with these particular people? Both sets of clients had photos of their dogs up. Well, that's great because I'm an animal lover and I just got a new puppy. I saw that one client was wearing a black YSL kind of wallet on a chain and I happened to own that exact same purse. They both love Louboutin. They both love Louis Vuitton. I see that they both go out eating a lot. So if they're going to catch at Aria, I've been there. If they're going to Carbone, I've been there. I'm looking for everything, colors, outfits, brands, bags, restaurants. Why? Because at the end of the day, all things being equal, people want to work with people that they like. And all things not being equal, people still want to work with people that they like. So will I like this client? Will I enjoy them? This is where I'm taking ownership of the process and I'm trying to say for myself, are we a good fit? Are we going to get along? Is there going to be a vibe? Because you do your best work with people that you have a very legitimate connection with. And now I want to match and mirror who they are. This is not about lying. Please understand that. This is not about lying. It's not about manipulation. The minute you lie, it breaks down trust and it devalues who you are and it devalues what you do. And clients can smell if you're being inauthentic the same way dogs smell fear. So if you're looking at something, it's not about me saying, have I been to the exact same place? Have I done the exact same thing? I had an instance where a client kept referencing a certain place on the Amalfi Coast in Italy that I simply hadn't been to. I couldn't connect to it because I hadn't seen it, I hadn't smelt it, I hadn't touched it or tasted it. But what I could connect to was the fact that we had both stayed at the same resort in Mexico. So this is where I'm able to talk about international travel. This is where I'm able to talk about connecting with people who speak a different language. This is where I'm able to talk about working within another culture. I wasn't ever lying, but I mixed and matched the things where I felt we were a good match. This let me prepare, vi prepare visuals and talking points. So the first thing I wanted to do when I was setting up for my first meeting is I wanted to look like my clients. My client has carried this YSL bag on a number of occasions. I carried that YSL bag. The first thing she said when she walked in was, oh my God, I have that bag. I'm like, oh my God, me too. I love it. Now we're friends. Now we connect. Now we understand each other. I made sure that I looked at how they dressed and I mimicked that style of dress. If they wore a lot of patterns, I wore a lot of patterns. If they went to neutrals, I went to neutrals. Why? Because your clients want to feel like you know them. They want to feel like they could be friends with you. They want to have that instant sense of comfort and trust. I had talking points prepared. Okay, I don't know anything about sports. So when I'm dealing with somebody where a father to be or a groom is a professional athlete, I've got nothing. But I can talk all day long about puppies. I can talk about hotels. I can talk about travel. I can go in and say to them, hey, I saw that you guys recently hiked up at Red Rock. I haven't done that, but I did this really cool hike out at Lake Mead where you go through this own abandoned train track. Have you done that? Because I'm not trying to talk to them as a client. I'm trying to talk to them about a friend. And I'm trying to talk to them as a person who knows them, who cares about them, and who understands them. So when you're setting up for this meeting, definitely go through, make sure you match them visually, make sure you have talking points, and make sure you're approaching it as a person. Now the rest of these things in terms of making a good impression, they should be very simple. They should be easy. So for example, number one, don't be late. Being late 
conveys a level of disrespect for your clients and for yourself. It implies a lack of self-control and poor, poor planning. And my thought is, if you can't manage the things you know, if you can't anticipate traffic or an accident or something like that, if you're not mentally prepared to succeed at the first meeting, how can you manage the things you don't know? How will you be prepared to handle you know, a, a strange thing that comes out of left field? So never ever be late for a client meeting. In fact, you should really arrive early. You will find me sitting at coffee shops, restaurants, and in offices for 30 minutes in advance doing nothing but checking my phone. Why? Because I want to be familiar with the space. I also want to take a power seat where I can observe everything. I want to sit towards the back, preferably with my back to a wall, where I can see the door and I can see the flow of traffic. Why? Because when my client is seated across from me, they can't. That means I now have them as a captive audience. They're not looking around at anything else. They're focused on me. Meanwhile, I can see everything else. I can tell if the food is coming. I can tell if the drinks are coming. I can see if a friend is coming over that might interrupt our flow of thought. So always be early. Always take aware of your surroundings and make sure that you're looking for things that may or may not impact your meeting. You want to make sure that you look good. Be pressed. Be dressed. Be polished. I don't care how casual your clients are. However it is they tend to dress, you need to dress one or two steps above. Why? Because dressing well is just good manners. It shows that you care enough to put the time and the effort and the intentionality into prepping for this meeting. Your clients deserve to meet with somebody who takes care of themselves. And so the number of times that I have seen people go to meetings, whether it's planners, designers, something like that, and they're wearing ill-fitted tank tops or they're dressed more like they're going to a club and less like they're going to a meeting. When I see people show up in flip-flops, even in Hawaii, you can wear a beautiful sandal. You don't have to wear a flip-flop. It's just about saying this matters and I'm dressing to honor the occasion and my relationship with you. You want to set the stage. You want to create a sense of comfort. Take care of your clients. If you're at a coffee house, have a drink waiting. If you're not sure that they drink coffee, have waters waiting. Make sure that the chairs and the table don't wobble. When they come and they see you and they sit down, everything that they need should be right then and there in front of them so they're not looking. You want to make sure that your marketing and your materials and your tools are out. Have your business cards out. I always set two bottles of water and right next to it, I put my business card. If I'm meeting with two people, two bottles, two cards. Sometimes I leave them pens. It depends on the type of meeting that we're having. But everything that I'm doing should be right there. If I'm bringing magazines or books to reference, I have them out and stacked. Very easy for me to grab, but far enough away so that the client can't reach for them. Because I want to control the flow and I want to control the narrative. I also take the time to prepare my tech. I make sure that everything is fully charged. I want my phone charged. I want my iPad charged. I want my computer charged. I want to connect to my Wi-Fi in advance. I want to have a backup power source. There's nothing worse than sitting there going, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I don't have Wi-Fi. Can somebody get me the Wi-Fi? Don't do that. Have it prepared in advance. Be ready to answer and to do some show and tell. And ultimately, just be a person don't jump right into the business side of things. It feels gross. Ask your clients questions. Be interested in who they are and have interesting things to say. If you've done your research, if you've prepared your avatar, and if you've done some development on who they are, this should be easy. You want to be engaging. Tell stories about yourself and about your business, but always relate it back to the client and show how who you are is going to impact their experience and establish yourself as an expert. Present ideas and images that are gonna be backed with a proof of success so that your clients know that they can trust you. And at the end of the conversation, at the end of the meeting, you really wanna follow up and finish very strong. It's not just about saying to them, okay, well, this was great, it was nice to meet you. It's about preparing them for what's to come. At the end of the meeting, if you don't feel that you're a good fit, 
everyone at the table knows it. At which point you should be very comfortable saying, you know what, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet with you. This was so fantastic. It was so much fun. I wish you the best. And if you have any other questions, please reach out to me. It's a nice way of acknowledging the fact that we're probably not going to do this. But if you're feeling the vibe, if you really want the business, you need to say so. You need to turn around and say, I just have to tell you, I had the best time this afternoon. I loved meeting you in person. I loved getting to know you. I would love nothing more than to work with you. And so I, I'm just going to ask the question, do you feel comfortable? Are you ready to say yes right now? And see what they say. Sometimes you'll get an immediate yes. Nothing better than that in the world. You may have them say, I would love to, but you know, I have to, I have to ask my mom or I have to talk about her. We have to look at the numbers. You go, great, not a problem. I'm going to let you guys go. And tonight I'm going to follow up with you with a quick recap of what it is we discussed here. And then we're going to give you the weekend to talk and let's plan to connect again on Monday. Monday, take out your phone. Are you available at, let's see. Oh, there we go. Noon on Monday. Does that work? And if they say yes, you put it in your phone, you have them prepared to talk, you are prepared to talk, and you set aside 15 to 20 minutes to answer any questions and to hopefully close the deal. You always, always want to make sure that you understand that people's impression of you starts the moment that they become aware of your very existence and it continues on throughout the process. It doesn't end when they say yes or no. It continues. Every touch point is an opportunity for you to reinforce who you are and to remind them of why they chose you in the beginning. So please, my friends, remember that it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. So if you think about that, you will always do things differently. That is a little bit of education from Warren Buffett. I am Andrea Eppolito, Wedding and Events Lifestyle. I spend my life creating extraordinary moments for extraordinary people, bending the world to my will, turning moments into memory. I hope you had a great time today. I loved speaking with you. And right at the end, I do have some bonus content. I wanna show you some branding videos. Thank you so much for participating in the Wedding MBA. Thank you for spending your time with me, and I look forward to hearing from you soon. My name is Andrea Eppolito. I am the owner of Andrea Eppolito Wedding and Events. I know that when a lot of people think about wedding planning, it's the pretty. That, that comes to mind, like everybody loves the pretty, what is it gonna look like? And I love the stuff, I think that the stuff is great, but what matters isn't so much the stuff, but it's how the stuff makes you feel. One of the first questions I ask all of my couples is, when people leave your wedding, what is it that you want them to say? What is it that you want them to feel like? What, what were your big points? Because a budget is just a list of priorities with a number attached. And so we start with like, well, what do I want these 200 people to remember? We are recarpeting the entire room in white carpet. And then over that, we are building a stage on each side of the ballroom and we are connecting those two stages with kind of like a fashion show style runway. It's going to be 80 feet and it's going to connect one side of the room and the other. Once the carpet goes down it needs to be covered in plastic obviously because it's white. Then all of these pieces go down. This is an install that just like the hard set, just that stuff is going to take about 18 hours to put in. This is a 22 month process. This is two years of my life and like I, I can't wait to see this come in. Who carpets a ballroom and then covers the carpet and then covers the cover? I guess I do. I, I get to do that and I work with cool people who know how to do it really well. So I'm excited to see it come to life. I 
do take them out looking for their jewelry. Sometimes I take them shoe shopping. I'm at all of the tastings. I am at all of the photography. So today we're here at the W Hotel because my bride, who is so stunning and so beautiful, we went on 12 interstate trips looking for dresses. And to put that much of an emphasis on what are you gonna wear and then not kind of properly document it would feel like a waste. The dresses are having their own photo shoot and then my bride is getting in the dresses for a kind of dry run and she's gonna have all old school beautiful bridal portraits done in advance in a room that is built for bridal so that on her wedding day, she can be really present in the moment. She can be with her family and friends and her guests. She doesn't need to constantly worry about like, oh, let me step out so I can get a pretty picture in my dress. We're gonna have so many gorgeous pictures of her that it's, it's gonna be silly. She's gonna look like a model. to identify the potential stressing points for my clients. What's gonna make them crazy? What's gonna make them angry? What's gonna bring them back to a sad moment? And trying to sidestep those and remove them and avoid them because I so, like I want my people to have the most perfect day. I want them to walk away and say, if nothing in my life ever goes right again, this was perfect. For this wedding in particular, you know, the bride had been on Pinterest and she'd seen a lot of social media and she kind of thought she wanted color and then I went to their home and their entire home is gray. And I said, I think that you're looking at magazines and you're on social media and the internet is telling you that you want color, but you don't live with color, you don't communicate in color. Like sometimes what a couple thinks they want is what's been fed to them and it takes a little bit more of like a deep dive into you know, who are you each as individuals and then who are you as a couple and where do you stand in the world? And then I try to kind of bend the universe to their will so that on their one wedding day, it is the perfect environment for them to be who they are as people and for them to show that to the group that they've, you know, invited kind of into their life. Wedding planning is a collaboration. But the reality is, is I'm a stranger to you and we're gonna sit down and I'm gonna ask you the most intimate questions about your relationship, your family. We need to like each other. So for me, it's very important that we start off in a really honest place. And a lot of times, the first time we talk, we don't even really talk about the wedding. Like, I have two kids. I have a husband that, you know, hung the moon. I have all of these pieces in my life and it's really important to me that like you dig that. As somebody who really cares about my client's experience, I limit my client base to about six to eight couples a year. And I do that because I really want to be able to give you all of my time, all of my attention. I don't ever want you to have to wait for anything. When you choose me, I choose you back. And then we're in it together. Like now we're playing and now it's fun. And I want to be able to be there for everything all the time. And I, I couldn't do that with like a crazy number of people. I have to keep my client base small because, you know, being, being one of five, makes you really special. Be one of my chosen five, that's, that's a big deal. We're live and so my job is really just supporting everybody else. I don't make any bouquets. I don't set any tables. I don't cook any food. I don't document anything. I am purely at this point a conduit helping people do what they need. know just how lucky I am that I get to do this, that people invite me into their lives, that they put that, that trust in me. I take it so seriously because I want the story, like I want their love story 
to just be fantastic. And so I happen to be based in Las Vegas. That's my, ge my geography. I'm very, very lucky in that I get to go and move and work throughout the world. I care less about the city that you wanna work in and way more about the work that we're gonna do together. When you live a life where you get the best of everything every single day, how do I make your wedding day blow all that out of the water? Like, how do I make the wedding day better than every single day of your life where you have the best that the world has to offer? And so I am very fortunate in that I get to work anywhere in the world and everywhere in the world. It's wherever my, my clients and the love story takes us. The Engage Conference, the Engage Community, anchors us all together. It's where we get to meet, it's where we get to know each other, and it's where we develop a level of trust in each other. One of the things that I was afraid about coming into this particular wedding, none of us have worked together before. But when everybody is new, how do you foster a feeling of camaraderie? How do you make it one team, one dream? And that's why it was really important to me that everybody came out a day early and that we just got to play in Vegas, which I know is a terrible place to be. Javier sees the world the way that I do in terms of bigger is better and more is more and I want things to be lush and dramatic and I want it to feel like, is it like, can I touch it? Is it real? And Javier likes that. He likes to bring the drama. So for floral, there was nobody else I could have talked to. DBD's capability to sketch something and then render it and then build it from scratch, they can produce anything. I needed them to be a part of this team. You can always expect to get some laughs out of Andrea, and it's always a fun time. She is more is more. She andrifies stuff. Palace Party Rental from LA, their inventory of furniture is so extraordinary that those three teams coming together really were the dream in terms of production. This is one of those times where you're gonna make this huge emotional investment and this really big financial investment. And this is one of the only things you're ever gonna do that's gonna mean more 10 years from now than it does today. And so to properly enjoy it, you have to document it. Dennis Kwan was a shoe in for photography because he speaks Cantonese and Mandarin. He's able to communicate with the guests on a much more organic level. Andrea does the most detailed, incredible timeline I've ever seen. She gets all the vendors on the same page about the vision for the wedding, and I've never seen anyone approach it in that way. And then for video, I mean, I just, I adore LaRev for a couple of reasons. I love working with a husband and wife team, and here's why. You get two totally different energies in the space. I have somebody now who sees something from a really masculine perspective, and then I have a really feminine energy and somebody who understands what it is to be a bride. That gives me such a balanced way of telling this, because this is a movie. At the end of the day, I mean, this is their Crazy Rich Asians wedding video. She wants us to get to know each other so that we can do the best work together as a team. Um, and again, she's not afraid to accept feedback and run with it, and we, I really appreciate that about her. Alwyn and Cass is great because they're in Vegas and in California. And so now I have a hair and makeup team that the bride doesn't need to travel for trials. So that was amazing. Working on an Andrew wedding is absolutely wonderful in the sense that I love more information. Like the more information you give me about the client, about what they're like, what they're needing, all the logistic things helps me do my job better. We've got Miko, she is a singer, kind of a little bit indie, but they love her. And the bride spent her early 20s listening to quite a lot of her music. And then the bride also, she likes swing, so we have a full swing band. Andrea and I met at the Engage conference. Uh, she was so full of information. She's fast paced, she's no nonsense, she gets it done. I have asked a lot of the people that are working on this wedding, and I got no pushback. Every single person that I said, well, what if we cut it in felt and we hung it from the sky? 
they were like, you know what, yeah, that's cool. Or what if we do these behind the scenes videos? Or, well, I know the tree is 14 feet long, but wouldn't it be cool if we took it apart and then we put it back together in the room? I know you only have 30 minutes, but you can do that, right? Nobody said no. Everybody bought such a level of excitement and like we are all in to make this happen. That means that I, I made the right decision. We're never gonna replicate this experience. This day, this team in this room is never ever gonna happen again. I really want to impress you guys. Like truly, I want you guys to go back and be like, I did an Andrea wedding.